Okay, the next item of business is topical questions. Uh, in order to get in as many questions as possible, and there's a lot of interest this afternoon, I'd welcome succinct questions uh, and answers to match. And question number one is Daniel Johnson. Excuse me, Mr. Johnson. I'd, just wait for your mic to come on. Oh, we tried. Got me. There we go. Right. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the potential impact on Scottish Government standard due diligence of reports of lost documentation related to the Fergus Marine ferry contract. Minister Ivan McKee. Uh, we have been absolutely transparent about the decision making process and the information which informed those decisions. There's a clear audit trail of key decisions and the basis on which they were taken in relation to the documents mentioned in the Audit Scotland report. A thorough search has been conducted and no ministerial response to the submission of 8 October 2015 has been located. As outlined in the Audit Scotland report, we have committed to a formal review following the completion of the vessels project. Daniel Johnson. Um, I don't quite know how to respond to that answer, <laughs> Deputy Timing <laughs> Officer, because on Thursday the Auditor General expressed frustration at the lack of records of ministerial decisions regarding the waiving of refund guarantees that would normally be expected in such a, a contract as that for the ferries. Written authority from ministers should be required for this, yet no record could be obtained by Audit Scotland. The Auditor General describes this as frustrating. He's being charitable. It is at best negligent and incompetent. At worst, it could be unlawful, breaching the Finance and Public Administration Act and or the Freedom of Information Act. So will the Minister commission an investigation into this matter to establish the facts and, critically, whether or not the law has been broken? Minister. The um, Scottish Government, Transport Scotland, along with Seamar, Land Ferguson's been in Port Glasgow, have all cooperated fully uh, with Audit Scotland and the Rural Economy and uh, Connectivity Committee inquiries. And this included provision of documentation, provision of a detailed written statement, as well as interviews with key personnel and attendance at REC by both officials and Scottish ministers. And we've also committed to undertake a review, as I said earlier, on completion of the two vessels. Daniel Jones. The problem is for transparency, the documents need to be there and they are not, and the law requires it. And sadly, this is not an isolated incident, neither in the context of the sorry saga of the two ferries, nor on other Scottish Government interventions. It follows a pattern of opaque decision-making and roughshod uh, process that can be seen elsewhere, such as the environmental indemnities for Liberty Steel found to have breached state aid laws, the Loch Arbor smelter, where hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money were put at risk through secret guarantees, a decision that only emerged after a two-year battle uh, for, uh, over FOIs with the Scottish Government by journalists, requests that the Scottish Government knew would be overturned on appeal. With the ferries, we saw them launched in time for the SNP conference, fake windows and all, before they were ready and on a timetable that cost taxpayers more. The pattern is of due process that is deficient, lacking transparency and deliberately distorted to suit political ends rather than public interest. So you could call this many things, negligent, incompetent, deficient. But when these decisions have all been willful and deliberate, the word I would use is corrupt. Perhaps not for individual gain, but a corruption of the process for party political gains contrary to the public interest. So if that's not the word the Minister would use, what word would he use? Minister. I, as I've already, already indicated, um, a thorough search was taken for those uh, documents and no ministerial response to that submission has been located. As I've already indicated, we've outlined an Audit Scotland report. We have committed to a formal review following completions of the Vessels project. But what is important to recognise, and Daniel Johnson and other members in the Chamber fail to recognise, is that Ferguson, seven years after those uh, events, is still employing hundreds and hundreds of people, is still uh, employing skilled people, is still contributing to the local economy um, and is still keeping... If the members, I know the members don't think that Scotland's industrial base is important, but if they maybe want to be quiet for a minute and listen to this answer, because this is important. This is important to the people of Scotland, the people of Inverclyde, that that yard is still employing hundreds of people and is keeping commercial shipbuilding on the Clyde alive. As in Lochaber, 
where the site there is employing increasing numbers of people and su being successful in, in, in what it is delivering the products uh, into the Scottish uh, and, and further afield markets. That is what is important, supporting Scottish industry. This Government makes no apology for being committed to supporting Scottish industry and for making sure that we develop and that hundreds and hundreds of people in those highly skilled, highly paid jobs are still in employment, which would not be the case of either of those two parties had been making decisions on the future of Scottish industry. We have a number of supplementaries. I would hope that both the questions and the answers would be listened to uh, respectfully. First of all, uh, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Judging by some of Daniel Johnson's comments, they probably would rather the yard actually was not there and the jobs were not there either, or the, or the yard's future. Uh, there has already been a thorough parliamentary inquiry in the last term of this Parliament and also now the scrutiny by the Audit Scotland, both of which have generated significant reports and recommendations. Can the Minister set out what the Scottish Government did to contribute to and cooperate with both inquiries, including providing relevant information? Minister. Uh, indeed, and as I have already indicated, the Member makes these points very well. The Scottish Government Transport Scotland, along with CMAL and Ferguson's Marine Port Glasgow, all cooperated fully with Audit Scotland and the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee inquiry. And this included provision of documentation and provision of a detailed written statement, as well as interviews with key personnel and attendance at REC by both officials and Scottish ministers. And as already indicated, we have also committed to take a review on completion of the two vessels. Mr Lumsden, if you have a question to ask, press your button and I may call you. Uh, Graeme Simpson. Many thanks. It, th this is institutional corruption yeah. on a grand scale. Yeah. Ivan McKee is showing breathtaking arrogance if he yeah. thinks there has been any, any transparency over this. This is the SNP's secret Scotland at its worst. Now, let me quote you another law. The Public Records Scotland Act 2011, which requires the Scottish Government to have a records management plan. And the Act requires the plan to identify the individual responsible for the management of a department's public records. So who was the person in this case? I want the name. And why didn't they ensure that there was a record of the decision-making process? Minister. Uh, as already indicated, we have been transparent. We have published the documents that are available. We have complied with the inquiries that have taken place. We have committed to undertaking a review and completion of the vessels, um, and, uh, as was outlined in the Audit Scotland report. So we are being transparent. We are being open. We are producing the document as, as, as available and making sure that is in the public domain. And we have complied with the, 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 the inquiries that have taken place on this, and we have committed to undertaking a review on completion of the two vessels. But I go back to the point I made earlier. What uh, is at the core of this is the Scottish Government's absolute commitment to supporting Scottish industry, Scottish jobs, yeah. and uh, making sure that we continue to do so, um, whereas the parties uh, opposite clearly um, are not concerned at all about the people that work in these uh, sites and supporting their employment. Briefly, Paul McLennan. Point of order, Graeme Simpson. Presiding officer, what is the point of members coming to this chamber asking straight questions when the minister completely ignores the question and answers something else? What is the point? Mr Simpson, I think you will know by this stage that that is not a point of order. The content of ministerial responses is not the responsibility uh, of the uh, presiding officer. Paul McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. We can all agree that transparency and accountability are key in government. And, but I do not think the Scottish Government needs lessons in that from any member of the opposition, to be uh, quite frank. But we should not lose sight of why this Government stepped in to save Scotland's last remaining commercial shipyard and the importance of the work it is undertaking. Can the Minister provide an update on progress in this regard? Minister. The yard, uh, I thank the for the question. I can, I can, the yard has today announced completion of a major milestone in the build of one of the dual fuel ferries. And a major engineering operation, Hull 802, was fitted with its large bow unit, which at 100 tonnes is the largest single unit added to the ferry steel hull. This week will also see the final units lifted into place, completing the main hull and steel work in making way for the installation of the ferry's aluminium superstructure which is all the units that sit above the main deck. So good progress has been made in progressing the construction of these ferries. 
And of course, since this government nationalised Ferguson's, it has already delivered three smaller vessels. And by nationalising the shipyard, we have kept it open, kept people in work, rescued more than 300 jobs. And since October 2021, Ferguson's Marine has consistently employed over 350 staff. There have been 42 apprentices working and learning there since August 2021, and a further 15 will be taken on this summer. The yard has been in a period of turnaround since 2019. In the past two years have been challenging, exacerbated by the pandemic. But what is clear is that progress is being made. Three smaller vessels delivered, a new CEO appointed, is already making a difference in implementing a transformation plan. Hundreds of people and families' income maintained, including lots of independent small businesses as contractors, and two new ferries for the islands being built, with a real milestone in their construction being reached today. No wonder the opposition ever want to talk about or welcome that, this government's industrial strategy and how we're protecting jobs and industry across Scotland. Brief final supplementary, Katie Clark. It is clear that there have been multiple failings relating to this contract and that it is islanders, particularly islanders on Arran this week, who are paying the price. Does the minister not accept that any review cannot be delayed and that it must be a full investigation conducted independent of ministers? Minister. Well, what I have said is that we're making significant progress on delivery of those vessels, which is what matters to the people on, uh, on islands. And Calmar engaging on a daily basis uh, with the community on Arran and elsewhere. And the Minister of Transport has joined those calls to ensure that all possible actions are being undertaken with regard to ferry provision. And as I've already said, with regard to um, the uh, outlined in Audit Scotland report, this government has committed to a formal review following completions of the vessel project. And that is uh, a commitment we stick to. Douglas Lumpton. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, if the government are uh, so keen on uh, promoting transparency, will they agree to lift the gagging orders in place at Ferguson Marine? Minister. Uh, as already made clear, the, um, the Scottish Government, Ferguson's Marine and uh, uh, Transport Scotland, CMAL, have all cooperated fully with, uh, with Audit Scotland and uh, the REC Committee inquiry. Um, I've already said they've, co uh, they've, they've all fully cooperated with those inquiries. That's, that, that's the fact of the matter. And as I say again, we've already committed to undertake a full uh, review on completion of the two vessels. Question number two, Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the potential impact, oh sorry, pardon me, uh, that's Daniel Johnson's question, very well asked. <laughs> Worth asking again, given that we didn't get an answer the first time. <laughs> question number two, however, starting off, sir. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reported planned boycott of solicitors taking on summary cases brought under Section 1 of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018 from May the 3rd, 2022. Just about recovered, Minister Ashley. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Section 1 of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act, which criminalises coercive and controlling behaviour, has been in operation for over three years. And last year, Section 1 cases accounted for around 5% of all domestic abuse cases. To avoid uh, intimidation and further traumatisation of victims, Parliament explicitly barred accused persons in these cases from representing themselves. So legal aid funding is available for Section 1 cases, as it is for other criminal cases. And if a case is particularly time-consuming, solicitors can apply to have additional costs met, rather than the fixed fee, through the exceptional case arrangements. Now, contrary to claims that legal aid funding overall has not increased in the past 20 years, the Scottish Government has increased legal aid funding by over 13% over the past three years, and in addition, a further substantial offer worth 7.5% for criminal legal aid and 5% for civil legal aid was made, but rejected by the profession last week, and an offer of mediation has also been made and remains on the table. Whilst we consider the legal profession's demand for 50% increase to all fees to be unaffordable, we remain committed to engaging with the legal profession to seek a reasonable and an affordable resolution to this matter. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that response? Just to remind everyone watching, the Domestic Abuse Act was this Parliament's flagship law designed to tackle the horrors of domestic abuse in Scotland. Nearly 1,600 charges were reported under Section 1 of it last year alone. Presenting officer, those accused under Section 1 cannot represent themselves in court. So if they cannot afford a solicitor themselves, then the trial will inevitably be postponed 
more people will be held on remand for longer, which the government says it wants to tackle, and more victims of abuse will simply wait longer for justice. That is the reality of the situation, Minister. Can I ask you, given all of this, can the Minister tell us how many trials she thinks will now be postponed or delayed as a result of this action by solicitors? And given that Scottish courts were shortchanged by £12 million in this year's budget, does she now regret that decision? Minister. Well, I've already said to the member that it is 5% of uh, domestic abuse cases. And obviously, domestic abuse cases, as the member has outlined, um, is a priority area for this government. And uh, we fully understand the impact that long waits can have on victims. So both prior to and throughout the COVID pandemic, priority has been given to progressing cases involving domestic abuse. Uh, we invested £50 million last year and a further £53 million this year to help tackle the unavoidable backlogs in the justice system, as well as enhanced support for victims. And the latest figures from the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service confirm that both solemn and summary sheriff courts are progressing cases above pre-COVID volumes, and we will continue to support the process of justice COVID recovery. But the member is right to say that this is a serious disruptive action, and so we are considering ways in which we can work with willing partners to address any shortfall in the availability of solicitors as an absolute priority. Uh, so also there are avoidable delays and there are unavoidable delays in court backlogs. This is an entirely unavoidable one. An entirely unavoidable one. This is serious stuff. Solicitors do not boycott cases just for the fun of it. They tell us the reality of what's happening in our legal profession. There's barely a criminal lawyer in Scotland under 30 years of age. Everybody knows that. There's been a 25% reduction in solicitors working in legal aid cases, and 40 firms have quit the scheme altogether in the last two years alone. The SSBA tells us that the government has consistently ignored the profession when it was told that it was in crisis. The Law Society of Scotland went even further, presiding officer. They said that the current crisis in legal aid threatens the very core of justice, risking irreparable damage. Minister, legal aid is at its worst position since devolution, and everyone will admit that except you. Your party has been in government for 15 years now. Why is it in such a mess and what are you going to do to fix it? Minister. Um, I would remind the member, and I believe we did have an exchange on this matter just last week, that in Scotland we have of course maintained eligibility and scope for legal aid in Scotland, which is not the case elsewhere in the rest of the UK where the Conservatives are in charge. So we have both eligibility and scope here. We recognise the importance of legal aid providers and we are committed to continue to listen to them and to continue to invest in them. So it is not simply not possible to say that the government has not been listening and the government has not been responding. Over the last two years, we have listened and we have responded. And I'll just take the member through just a couple of the things that the government has done, uh, actions that the government has taken in direct response to things that have been raised with us by the profession. So when the COVID pandemic first um, reared itself up, um, obviously there was going to be a vast impact on businesses of all kinds, including obviously um, business, legal aid businesses. We actually straight away changed the law so that we could bring in something called an interim payment. And that was to make sure that we were able to help cash flow for those businesses because we recognised that that was an immediate concern. We then went on to put £9 million of grant funding in place to firms whose businesses had been affected by the pandemic. So that was grant funding for COVID resilience. Um, then, in response to uh, capacity issues that had been raised with us by the profession, we put in place a £1 million traineeship fund. So that's supporting trainees, 75% of whom are women, because again, that was raised with us as a concern by the profession. We also then, um, over the last few years, I've put in permanent across-the-board fee rises. So that was 3% in 2019, 5% in 2021, and 5% in April, which just came um, on stream um, at the beginning of this month. So that's £10 million just over the last year in permanent across-the-board rises. Now, we also put a detailed uh, package of fee reforms. Uh, these were reforms that the profession had highlighted to us. Uh, of being of significant concern to themselves. Uh, these were criminal fee reforms. Uh, that was a package that was worth around 3.8 million. So added together with another 5% rise that we offered to the profession last week, 
I do not think it is possible to say that this government is not listening and not responding. Thank you, Minister. Like the previous questions, a lot of interesting supplementaries, but in order to get them all in, we're going to need uh, brief questions and slightly briefer responses. Minister, um, Audrey Nicholl, firstly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what level of engagement they've had with the profession over the last three years. Minister. So I have regular routine meetings with the Law Society and additional meetings were held during the early stages of COVID lockdown, moving to very regular meetings with officials and ministers to discuss the impact of COVID on solicitors and then close working with officials on mitigation of that impact, uh, including the grant funding that I mentioned in my previous answer. Uh, the former Cabinet Secretary and I met personally with representatives leading up to the £20 million package of funding. And that close working has continued with the most recent meeting with the Law Society being last Thursday. Um, at both an official and a ministerial level, there have been frequent discussions as both part of the structured timetabled meetings and often on um, a weekly basis. And we also established an engagement group as well so that officials and representatives from the profession could discuss all the issues that were connected to legal aid. And this group have met on five occasions over a six month period last year. Katie Clark. Almost half a billion pounds was cut from the legal aid budgets between 2007 and 2019. So any increases since 2019 do not compensate for that scale of cuts. This dispute, as the Minister knows, relates to domestic abuse cases. Does she agree with me that they can be both complex and time-consuming? That the solicitors themselves are raising legitimate concerns and that this dispute undermines the government's strategy on violence against women and girls. Minister. Um, I thank the member for that question. I, think I would uh, um, completely agree with the member that these type of cases are complex and time consuming, as the member has put that in her words. So if solicitors feel that the fixed fee doesn't reflect the time that they spend on these DASA cases, they can apply to have the fixed fee disapplied and a time and line fee applied through exceptional case status arrangements. But I would say to the member that prior to this action, um, we were not aware of solicitors raising specific issues about DASA cases with us. Had they done that, I would certainly have looked at that. And I would say that that offer is still on the table, that if uh, solicitors who are working in this area feel that fees for these particular ty type of cases are not sufficient, I am more than happy to discuss that with them. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In response to the Bellamy Independent Review of Criminal Legal Aid, UK Government proposals include, include increasing legal aid rates by 15 per cent, as recommended by the report. Can the, can the uh, Minister um, say how this proposal compares to the offer the Scottish Government have made to the legal profession? Minister. Yes, yeah, so other parts of the UK, as we've uh, discussed already, are facing um, very similar challenges. So uh, down south, they had the Bellamy Review, which um, concluded recently, and that recommended a 15% rise on the basis of a comprehensive study, which took place with the cooperation of the Law Society down south. Um, we asked the Law Society of Scotland to cooperate with, uh, with us on a similar analysis so that we could get similar evidence-based approach to fees in Scotland, but they didn't believe that that process would be of material benefit. So taking account of the previous 5% and 5% increases and the further 7.5% offer that we have made recently, which has not yet been accepted, the Scottish Government's offer to the legal profession already exceeds that amount uh, that was recommended by the Bellamy Review. Thank you. Uh, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In answer to Jamie Green, the Minister gave some percentage rises to suggest that all is well. Can the Minister tell us what are the actual percentages once inflation is accounted for? Minister. Um, I can't remember exactly what I said in terms of 5% was 5% of domestic abuse cases. So if the member is referring to the 3% in 2019, the 5% in 2021, or the 5% um, in April of this year, then that amounts to £10 million of investment in the last year alone. So the government is listening to what the profession are saying. 
I am listening to what the profession are saying. I am, my door is open to discuss with the profession fee rises, whether that be across the board, whether that be specific rises um, in response to specific sets of, of fees. Um, I will say, however, that the request by the profession for um, a 50 per cent um, across the board fee rise at the moment, in light of public sector funding pressures, that request would amount to about £60 million a year, and that is not affordable. But we are committed to working with the profession, engaging with the profession, to seek a resolution on this matter. And briefly, Stephen Kerr. Um, thank you, Deputy Fine Officer. The Scottish Bar uh, Solicitor Bar Association say that they have been ignored by the Minister. Uh, in terms of uh, complex and lengthy cases, in terms of access to justice, in terms of the number of people leaving the legal aid profession, the, the work that's being done by, uh, in legal aid. So is the minister in the same meetings as the Scottish Solicitor Bar Association, or is she in a parallel reality? Minister. I think the only person in this chamber that's in a parallel reality, of course, at the moment is the member. If he was not listening to my extensive answers detailing the um, very regular consultation that the government has with representatives of the legal profession. So instead of repeating my earlier answer, I will add um, to what I think uh, may be the last question on this issue, that of course I accept that there is an issue here. I'm not at any point saying that I think that, um, that everything is okay. And I totally understand that some practitioners feel that they um, would like to have higher fees. And that is um, the way that we obviously take that forward is to negotiate that in order that we can try to resolve that issue. And that is what the government is committed to doing. And I've restated that position again today. We are also, though, which may be of interest to the member, undertaking uh, wider work on the legal aid system. And we will bring forward a bill on legal aid in this session of the parliament. Now that presents an opportunity to reimagine legal aid and perhaps to put it on a more sustainable uh, footing financially to imp improve the experience for users and for practitioners. Thank you. That uh, concludes this item of business. There will be a brief pause to allow the front benches to change before we move to the next item.